the coronavirus has definitely changed things. So we would like to take the opportunity to share some encouraging words from your local conference. We know that many churches throughout the Kentucky Tennessee Conference are not able to meet, but we know through technology you are able still to worship. And so we want to bring a worshipful attitude to you this Sabbath, whether it's the Sabbath that you watch this presentation or in the weeks to come. We have a special message that's going to be shared by Elder Steve Haley, our conference president, and we have a little ministry nugget or stewardship note that we would like to share with you on giving. We just hope that the special music and the things that follow will be a tremendous blessing to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to view this presentation from your conference. We hope it will be a tremendous resource to you because we continue to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and truly for God's work to be done so that Jesus may soon return. May God richly bless you as you continue watching this presentation. Well, Aaron, I'm glad that you're willing to join me for just about five minutes or six minutes or ten minutes, however long, um, about giving. You know, people this Sabbath, with the coronavirus, things are changing. And uh, even giving is changing in different ways. And so I thought it would be good, and you thought it would be great if we could at least explain to our constituents and members throughout the conference different ways in which they can give and even the importance of giving as a part of worship. Because I know they'll be viewing things online through Zoom and, and different mediums. And so um, I know giving is close to your heart mm -hmm. <laughs> as a treasurer of our conference. But I really am thankful that you're going to take this time and, and share um, with the people around the conference how giving is changing and, and how they can get involved, even if they're in their home. So maybe you could take a few minutes and share with us how that, how that transpires. And of course, we're going to show everybody on the screen as well how it goes to kind of walk you through some steps. Um, and we hope that it will be a tremendous blessing and a resource for you. So, Aaron, what are some of the ways that, that people can get involved, even if they're in their home, um, they're not going to church, but they're still doing some things online? Sure. Well, thank you, Marshall. Uh, I want to thank you for, for having me on here. And as, as you said, we have experienced tremendous changes just in the last two weeks. It's the, the pace of how things have changed has just been... Uh, astronomical how things continue to change right. day by day. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we thought, um, well, maybe, well, maybe a few of our churches may have to close, but as this continued to, to develop so quickly, now most of our churches are closed. And uh, that is difficult, uh, but as you said, we are adjusting, we're adapting, and we're, we're looking to still um, experience the worship service in a, in a virtual way, the best that we can, and obviously want us wanting to get back to our churches as soon as we can. Even in stewardship in general, I know sometimes we think of stewardship just as in the local, when I come to church, my part of being a steward is when the plate is passed around, but if you don't right. have a plate being passed around and you still want to be supporting your local church and you still want to be supporting the gospel ministry throughout the conference, um, it's still important. They can still be stewards in their homes. Absolutely, yeah. Stewardship encompasses everything that we do uh, with, with returning our tithes and offerings being obviously an important part of stewardship, but everything we do is, is an act of stewardship. One thing I have been continually reminded of is uh, the passage in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 mm -hmm. where uh, King David uh, says this incredible prayer of what a privilege it is for us to give back for everything that God has done for mm -hmm. us. And uh, in these times of uncertainty and many people with lots of fear right now because of the uncertainty, and I know many people have been affected by this, we still are able to remember where all of our blessings come from and how we can continue to partner with God and give back to Him. You know, it's interesting, I found out that like during World War II, you know, we had a, a, a crisis um, and 
And yet, it's interesting how the church still continued to grow. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing looking at the statistics. And so I know that we want to give people the tools here to still be involved, even if there's social distancing. They can right. still be involved and still support the work of the church. Yes. And, uh, and that's, a, that's, a, that's an important part of the process. And, and we hope that people, you know, um, get involved in that process and, and, and can uh, learn how to, you know, do that. And so Absolutely. maybe you can share with us some of the ways or sure. so, put it out there for people. Sure. So uh, as many of you may have already be aware, but there's some of you that are tuning in now that are not aware, uh, a critical part of being able to continue to uh, participate in in worship and in returning of your tithe and offerings is through uh, online giving. And the, the church has had this platform out for um, two, several years, um, but at, right now during this time, it is a critical piece that our church offers for us to continue to be able to um, fulfill ministry. Um, I haven't mentioned that, but in returning our, our tithes and our offerings, that is what is supporting the work of, of the ministry that happens in this conference, the pastors that were paid, the, the teachers, and, and I can go on a very long time about that. <laughs> but I do, wanna, I, I do want to, to share with you how simple and easy it is um, to, to participate in giving online. And um, I believe at this time we're going to look at, at, at the, the logistics of that. Yeah, we could bring that up on the screen. That would be great if we could see that. We want everybody else to be able uh, to see how, this, how they can start. Um, matter of fact, you could walk us through. You're taking a look at it too, Aaron. Sure. So you're on the webpage of, of, our, of our conference, Kentucky-Tennessee Conference. And we're, we're here because we recognize that there still are some of our churches in the conference that are not signed up for online giving. I've sent a message out to the pastors and treasurers on how to enroll, um, and I would encourage them to con continue to contact my office if they have further questions on how to get your local church set up on this. But if you're We'll, we'll get to the online giving through our, our website here. So if your church is not enrolled, you can come to our website, www.kytn.net, and you can click on the online giving uh, tab, which is right to the right of the homepage there. So let's go ahead and... We're going to kind of load here. There we go. So when they click on that online giving, they're going to be brought to this page what's what's the importance of this page right so as soon as as soon as that is clicked you you get um you get you come to this page which which looks like a tithe envelope uh and and so it's almost as if you're in your pew back at your church now some of the categories are going to vary a little based on what the conference or what the church puts in now i'm gonna let's go back up to the top I already have a login. Some of you will have to create a login on the top right. Um, you click on the login button, and I'm going to go ahead and log in here. And, and for our viewers, I just, I just want to share something really quick. It's a little bit delayed. At home, it would go a little bit faster, but we're, we're recording this and doing this all online simultaneously That's right. for them. So, um, you know, that delay only kind of comes when we're doing this, but at home, it should be pretty seamless. That's right. So, um, good, we're logged in. Now, um, up at the top right-hand corner, you can see where if, if, if your church, again, if your church is not um, enrolled and, and you want to be able to give your tithe and some of the conference offerings, you can do it here. But I'm going to go to, we'll go to the Madison campus, Seventh-day Adventist Church there. You see that? So, you can see Madison campus is enrolled and several of our churches are enrolled. So you can pick your local church and um, I'm going to just put in some numbers here. Uh, well, I, well, let's go back. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to show you how you can pick the local church. So you can see Madison campus has several of their own 
unique local categories that you can support if you have your local church there. Can I, can I ask a quick question? Sure. So when, oh, I see. So when a person logs in, when a person logs in to this site and they go through here, how exactly, so they log in as a guest or they do they create their own login? Yeah, that's a good question. So, and you didn't see that because I had already created a, a profile a, a while back, but when they click on that login button on the top hand right of the screen where you're seeing my name, Aaron McNulty, right now, it's going to walk you through to create an account, and it's a very simple process. Got it. Yeah. So um, we're going to go back to, up to the right, top right, and change it back to the conference. Um, assuming this is if you did not, your local church was not enrolled. And I'm going to just put in, say, $100 in tithe. And then we'll put um, $50 in the um, conference advance under the conference category. And you can see we don't have the local church here because this is directly at the conference website. But if you had your local church, you would have your local church offerings, which of course are very important Sweet. for your local churches. Um, and then, um, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. This is just a test. So the total down at the bottom is $150 and we'll hit the continue button. And then you can see I have a bank account I've already set up. Now, um, and, and uh, this is the this is this is a good way to give because honestly it's the fees are a lot cheaper. You as the donor do not see any fees, but but the fees are cheaper for the church if you do it with your bank account and you can put your bank account information in. You know, it's interesting. Um, we do this all the time now. My wife mm -hmm. and I, Rosemary and I, we give online like this. And if you have different accounts, it'll actually show up. Like for instance, if I use my card. Then and I we have a couple different accounts. They actually show up on there, and you can choose specifically what account you want that money to come from. So it's it's very handy, right? Um, you know, to be able to use this. We use it most of the time, even though we take some offering uh, to church, yeah, as well. Yep. Um, but it's great. Go ahead. Absolutely. Sorry. So so that's that's the preferred method. If you're not able to do that, you can put a credit or debit card in, and you. We're not going to click on that, but you can see there's a link there where you could put credit or debit card information. Or if you had, a, as you were mentioning, a, a, a different bank account, you could put new electronic check, and that's how you put your bank account information. So we'll go ahead and click on the click on the button by my bank account, and then click continue. And then you can see here I'm. We're going to stop here, but this is the last step. It gives you a summary of, I've given $100 tithe, $50 conference advance, $150 total. And then once you hit the click confirm donation, you're going to get a confirmation screen. You also get a confirmation email. And then that's going to go, um, this will ultimately be transferred to if you were giving to the conference, it would be transferred to our bank account. We get the receipt information. We issue you the receipt. And then if your local church is enrolled, it goes to the local church treasurer where they enter it in and you get a receipt from your local church treasurer. So it's, it's a pretty simple process um, that I'm thankful that our church has that we can utilize while we're not able to be physically at the church building. You know, and this is something we definitely want to if you're learning this for the very first time, we want you to be able to encourage um, others to be involved. Um, you know, technology um, can be a curse, but it also can be a tremendous blessing. That's right. And while we're in our homes or, or wherever we're at with family, we can still, you can still give online in this way. And uh, so, Aaron, what are some of the encouraging things that you would like to share with people in relationship as we kind of close off in relationship to stewardship um, and, and, and giving that you'd like to encourage them with this Sabbath and, and every day to come until Jesus comes? Sure. Uh, I, I did want to mention one oh, more 
brief thing in regards to the online giving. Uh, this is all through Adventist Giving, hosted by the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists. And so you, you can not only do it the way I, we showed you by going to the conference website, but you can also go directly to AdventistGiving.org. Or if you have a smartphone, you can just type in Adventist Giving. You can get the app on your phone and it's going to direct you through the exact same processes that we just did. So it's all the same, kind that, of integrated. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, to, your, to your question oh, now, good. in closing, uh, yes, th these last few weeks have been very uncertain and unsettling for many people. Uh, I, as I said at the beginning, I'm, I take great comfort and joy knowing that we do serve a God that is in control. We serve a God that still sits on the throne. And he, uh, as, as we're reminded, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is going to see us through this. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, um, as the treasurer, uh, it's important for me that we're able to still um, have the resources that we need to continue to carry out ministry in the different shapes and forms. Your pastors, your teachers are still working very hard in but they're adjusting in order to, 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 to carry out ministry in this time that we're living out. So um, I encourage you to continue to remain faithful because um, God is faithful to us each and every day. And uh, um, I hope that, that this is helpful for you uh, as we continue to partner with God because as we remain faithful, um, I truly believe and know that His blessings will continue to be with us um, in these uncertain times. You know, I'm reminded of, of the widow that gave of her substance, you know, all that she had, and the Lord tremendously blessed her. And uh, whatever we can give, we need to give. But not only monetarily, we need to give in our time and our talents, and, and we can deal with that at a later point. But we hope this has been a tremendous blessing. And Aaron, thank you so much for taking the time to share and if you have questions, if people still have questions, what do you think they should do? Yes. Um, so we're the conference office is closed right now, but we're still taking we're still taking phone calls. You can call the conference office, um, call the treasury department, um, and we'll make sure we get back to you right away. Or you can email treasury at kytn.net if you have any questions on the logistics of this, um, how to how to ha get help on any of this. Um, we're, we will get back with you as, as soon as we can. And, and that's, that's what we're here to do is to serve, serve the members of this conference. So we will do that. Do you mind having prayer with Absolutely. us all? Absolutely. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are still in control and that you promised to, to be in control all the way until you come back again. And Lord, we uh, look forward to, you, to your soon return. Uh, but until that day, I pray that you would keep us faithful, uh, keep us encouraged, um, help us to be to minister to others that we come in contact with, although it may not be in person right now, mm -hmm. whether it be virtually. Um, and just um, as we navigate through um, some of the things we're doing right now while many of us are at home, we pray that um, you would help us to continue to go, be about your work. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thank you for how you continue to, to plan to lead and guide us. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
As I begin this message this morning, I'd like to invite you to join me as we pray. Lord, thank you for the possibility and privilege, the expectation that you show up at your appointed time and hour to bless us, to save us. I pray now that you would speak through these words to encourage those who will hear a message not from me, but from you. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It took a while to hit ground zero and explode, but about three weeks ago in early March, the bomb called COVID-19 found its target in our beloved nation, detonated, and the mushroom cloud just keeps growing. Have you noticed? At least for now, our lives have been a little bit interrupted, a little altered. Well, let's be real. Our, our lives have been flipped on end, and as we move into April, we're not sure when life returns to normal. And staying with this theme of things you could easily guess, on the operational side of what we do as a conference, events and schedule, the machinery of ministry, the pain of the COVID-19 disruption seems to create with each passing day some, some new trauma, some new hurdle, some new return to the question, what do we cancel next? And it's equally perplexing companion query, how do we predict and adjust our mission and ministry budget? Well, in your homes and your lives, for you personally, you've been asking your own variation of the same things. So there is at least one thing that we have in common. All of us are feeling a little extra stress. And I'm equally certain all of us would love some relief. If we can't find a cure for the virus by the end of today, well, then at least we want some hope. So please tell us, Mr. President, not Donald, but Steve, please tell us God is paying attention. And I'm going to be candid with you. In times like these, I need some confidence of what I sometimes know in theory, but now I'm praying to see demonstrated. And that is that God has got this, that he's still at the steering wheel of his church. So I want to share with you why I believe we're going to get through this, we're going to be okay, and that God is bigger than the problem. That observation of God's present sovereignty over all things, including a microscopic-sized virus, is based on a conviction drawn from my own life experiences and my faith in the Word of God. A faith that shouts out, listen, follower of Christ, there is, there is bigger, more important, more needed news for today than the latest COVID-19 news flash. And this greater truth of which I speak is as old as creation itself. As ancient as the era before viruses were known, much less given names, when for the first time, the first man and woman knew they needed help. And maybe, maybe some have been slow to get it, but most of us are starting to figure it out. We need help too. In just such an hour as this, when we seem so, so inadequate for this task, so uncertain in our predictions of a return to normalcy. We need help. We're looking for him. We're looking for his help. You see, it's in the crisis of the storm raging sea at midnight. At that hour that I expect to see Jesus walk on water, it's then I expect to see command, see God command the wind and the waves to be still. And in those, in those crisis moments, have you noticed? Now buckle up your seatbelts because while the ride's a little bumpy, We'll take on a little water and endure a few bruises along the way, but regardless, God knows where we're headed, even if we don't. So in the COVID-19 storm, get ready for an amazing display of God's power, and it starts with a gift of divine self-revelation. The unveiling of God's own self-portrait unique, uniquely made clear only in these times. In these times. When it's demanded that we hike a mile of emotionally rough road in our journey of faith, these times as we are standing still, neck deep in shifting financial quicksand, yet realizing the mission isn't finished and there's still much work to do in these times. When in our assessments we find ourselves sizing up the enormity of the task and shaking our heads in bewilderment. Have you noticed? It's as if we're traveling on our life voyage, and until this March, we thought we were doing it in comfort on cruise control. And now we're forced to detour. 
to take an off-ramp. We have to stop on the shoulder of the road and redraw the map to an uncertain destination. And knowing to get there, wherever there is, that's going to require we scale some Mount Everest-like peaks of missional difficulties. Can't get around them. It's the only path possible to answer the charge of the Apostle Paul to finish the race and complete the course. And we know for God's church that we must go forward because when God called us, it was with the command to not place our hand on the plow and look back. For the three angels' mission to go back is not an option. And while the future is a little scary, the unique picture of God that shines through the fog of despair is this. And I want you to listen to this. It's in these moments, it's in these moments that God delights in showing up. So have you noticed how he does that? He shows up when he's most needed. He shows up. Is the time of his arrival predictable? Does he wait till the darkest hour? Is, is the formula that triggers the arrival require that we come to the realization that we're desperate, that without him we can do nothing? Did God see a moment when we would have to push our plans and schedules aside to throw carefully planned budgets out the window because they no longer apply? And, and listen, go to a place he planned on in eternity past Go to a place that we don't know, wherever that place is. Can we be certain? Where will it take us? And most importantly, is he with us? I want to dive deeper into that truth, but before that, another observation that I've already hinted at, and it's this. Today is a day to wrap your heart around a blessing God reserves for us for today, for just now. A gift laid aside for times like these. It's, it's the outcome of what happens when in moments of enormous need, divinity invades humanity. When God graces our sinful, desperate lives with his touch of delivering grace. And what I mean is you can expect that in this dark moment, when God shows up, he includes a personal invitation for you to receive the accompanying gift of transforming grace. The gift that doesn't necessarily come on your birthday or at Christmas, but at bleak, discouraging times like this. Yes, there's a condition. This gift from him doesn't arrive without the presence of our spiritual hunger. We we can only receive it humbly when our hands are open like beggars asking for bread, or like thirsty travelers who've walked for miles through the sands of a burning desert, and unexpectedly stumble into a shaded oasis where the kind proprietor of the poolside cafe asks, would you like a drink of cold water? Oh, would we? So this refreshment for our tired hearts that I speak of that lifts us and changes us happens only when we're desperate and in need. And I think it's our confessed need that allows God, gives him the permission he requires to do something in us. A unique experience which happens only in the crucible of tough times. In a time such as the 2020 coronavirus spring, when we're most uncertain, God unlocks a door marked emergency exit only and asks us to step across the threshold and enter a holy place, a holy moment that he's prepared for us. I say holy because when God shows us, grows us, I'm sorry, grows us spiritually, It's always a divine act of holiness touching and changing sinful mortals. So have you noticed this? God takes tough times and grows the church, grows his people in a way that's not possible outside of crisis, not possible outside of adversity. A season such as we're now living in can be a personally transformational event. Here and now, right now for you and me, God performs a surgery of the soul. Right in the middle and thick of it all, the uncertainty of COVID-19 takes our bewilderment and exchanges it for his confidence, replaces our our sense of inadequacy with his promise that we can do all things through him. Doing these miracles in moments like this, when we're afraid, when we're not sure, when when we want to believe, but, but we can't. When our backs are against the wall, when the problems seem insurmountable, when the deck seems stacked against us, it's then that this, what I call this God shows up thing happens. God shows up. 
making his presence known, and he grows us. He makes us better. No, I, I don't always know the timing. It's on his schedule. But this I know, it will happen. When the world's stage is at its darkest, shrouded in the blackness of doubt and despair in a moment of his choosing, in a blazing display of illumined glory, he will show up and announce, I'm now going to do something remarkable in you and for you. And when I'm done with this, you'll know that once again, I am God. So a long introduction to a short but important point. God's deliverance also changes us. It happens when God shows up, and he he does more than save the day, he, he saves his people. Listen, he's good at this. He's got experience at this. He's been saving his people for thousands of years. And catch this, he does it in and through what would seem to be very unpromising methods and means. Oh, the Bible's full of examples, such as the story that begins once upon a time, Jesus was at the Sea of Galilee. And as the day is ending, the crowd, an audience that may have numbered around 10,000, they're hanging around, and it's getting late. Offering's been taken, the sermon's over, benediction has been pronounced, the final hymn is sung, but unlike our congregations and our churches, this one's not leaving at noon, doesn't want to go home, they want They want more of Jesus. But the always pragmatic disciples, why they are checking their watches, and they tell Christ what they think he doesn't know. Lord, it's late. And this place is in the middle of nowhere. There's no Kroger, there's no soup kitchen, there's no Taco Bell here. Send the crowd away so they can buy some food. Jesus tells the disciples, no, I want you to feed them. And they said what I might have said, Lord, Are you serious? 200 silver coins, about $15,000 in today's money. Teacher, if we have that kind of coinage, and we don't, but if we did, that wouldn't even begin to make a dent in the food bill. Now, I can't say for sure, but I think Jesus may have smiled when he heard that. A moment later, the disciples present to Jesus a boy with five loaves and two fish, And they comment because, again, they reason while he's a wonderful teacher, there are some subtleties and even some plain and obvious stuff that Jesus doesn't pick up on very well. Like this no-brainer observation on the part of the twelve, the disciples punch in the calculator and they've done the math on five loaves and two fish. This equation doesn't add. So they say, Lord, five loaves, two fish, but what is this when there are so many? And this time, Jesus smiles even bigger. Well, you know the rest of the story. Everyone gets fed, and then some, because when they're done, there are more than enough leftovers for the next potluck. And so notice this quality of the God who who shows up. Staring down the monster of impossible circumstances, Jesus doesn't bat an eye, because, you see, when God shows up, he doesn't need much to do great things. Need more convincing? Another story, faced with Jerusalem's own version of an April 15 IRS deadline, Jesus and Peter are asked to pay the temple tax, but there's a problem, you see. We know the feeling, they have no money. Jesus tells Peter, take a hook and line, go down to the lake, and the first fish that you catch, open its mouth and you'll find money to pay the tax. Tax bill, no money, no problem, just go catch a fish. Problem solved. Yep, God shows up. He doesn't need much to do great things. Another story. Standing in the dusty road outside the village of Bethany, his heart heavy as he embraces a a weeping Martha, a sister who shares with Jesus that had he been there a few days before, that her brother, Lazarus, would not have died. Then Jesus reminds her that he is the resurrection and the life, and and whoever believes in him will will never die. Do you believe this? He asks Martha, yes, Lord, I do. And it would seem that all Jesus needs is a little I do faith, a little mustard seed I believe to move a mountain called the grave and bring a dead man back to life. So when God shows up, notice, he doesn't need much to do great things. One of my favorite stories of great outcomes of the God who shows up in the crisis, of God delivering when the obstacles seem impossible, 
when the challenge is so far beyond human ability, is the narrative found in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 13, the story of Elisha and his servant. The context of this is intending to kill God's prophet, learning that, quotes, Elisha is in Dothan, verse 14, the king of Aram sent horses and chariots and a great army, and they went there by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early in the morning, skipping down a few verses, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. So he asked Elisha, oh, my master, what are we to do? Don't be afraid, Elisha said. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now that surprised the servant. Verse 17, Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes, eyes of the servant that he may see. The scripture says the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw that the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Just a simple prayer of faith, a pair of opened eyes. That's all it took. So let me say it again. When God shows up, he doesn't need much to do great things. Ellen White recognized the value of allegory in the 18th century volume, Pilgrim's Progress, and its depiction of good and evil and temptation, power of God to deliver us from the pit of unbelief and despair. In a modern adaptation of that same Christian literature genre, C.S. Lewis wrote his The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And there's a scene in the story when all of Narnia is thrilled when the mighty lion Aslan reappears after a long absence, but the joy turns to sorrow when Aslan concedes to a demand made by the evil white witch. Faced with Aslan's apparent defeat and certain of it, the Narnians rejoice to discover then what it seems to be a conclusion to the power in the reign of Aslan is turned to victory when they experience the lion's power when he emits this ear-splitting roar that causes the evil witch to flee in terror. Although all seems to have been lost, Aslan ultimately proves to be, to be greater than the enemy of his people. Listen, while it may be our adversary's plot to discourage, to harm, to destroy our church, to destroy this movement, this mission entrusted to us, our God is the Lion of Judah. His roar causes the demons to flee and the devil to hide and tremble at the prospect of his own demise. And in these times, I can promise, God is going to show up and he doesn't need much to do great things. A final battle scene example that I want to take you to, detailed in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And again, I'll condense the chapter just a bit into a handful of verses. Chapter begins with the context of finding Israel's king Jehoshaphat facing the approach of three pagan armies or nations. They're bent on the annihilation of Israel. It's a tough moment. Insurmountable obstacles ferocious enemies breathing down the neck of God's people. Afraid, the king stands before his people, and here's what he says. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations, and in your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. And now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Verse 11, Behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of our possession, which you've given us to inherit. We're powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. Powerless. Have any of you felt that way these past weeks? Powerless? Powerless facing the onslaught, the great enemy called COVID-19 and and all the ramifications of that, powerless? Listen, script, returning to Scripture, we're powerless against this great enemy. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Oh, wow. What a circumstance to find ourselves in. We don't know what to do, but our eyes, our eyes are on him. Verse 13, meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, their children. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, and he said, Listen, all Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, don't be afraid. 
Don't be dismayed at this great horde. The battle, oh, I love this, this passage. The battle is not yours, but God's. And isn't that true for us? And you know the rest of the story of how God delivered? It's a remarkable story. The next day is the little army of Israel led by a group of people literally singing praise songs to God at the front, the vanguard of the little army. They watch not as Israel's archers and infantry, but as the army of God destroys the enemies of his people. Ah, yes, the battle is not ours. It's his. So it's true. God doesn't need much to do great things. But don't don't miss it. He chooses to need us. It seems to always be true. He chooses to need the boy with the bread and fish. He chooses to need Peter, who goes down to the lakeside to hook a fish with money in its mouth. He chooses to require the sisters of Lazarus to offer up a little bit of faith. He chooses to wait for the confidence of Elisha in order to send the invisible army. He waits to hear the voices of the choir who march in front of Israel's army before he sends in the angel army. God doesn't need much. By his choice, he does need you. In this crisis, he will need you. He will need me. But listen, don't worry about that. Rejoice. You're standing in the mirror saying, really, he he needs me? Uh, Success of the mission is dependent upon me? Yes, upon all of us. You're not in this alone. Know for certain he's with you. He's going to see you through. He's going to take the little you place in his hands and accomplish his purpose and ministry by using you. So take this promise with you. Whatever problem you have this week, whatever impossibility that you're going to face this month, this year, know with assurance, our saving God will show up for you, and he will save us from our enemy. Let's pray. Lord, we trust in you. And sometimes your voice tells us to do that, which doesn't seem natural. We want to fix things. We want to defend. We want to fight. We want to determine the outcome. But sometimes your voice says to us, just stand still. Put your trust in me. Look to me the author and finisher of the faith, look to me. I'm going to show up, and I'm going to save you. May we trust that what you've done in the past, you will do again this day. We praise you for that promise. In Jesus' name, amen. and see the story for today answered prayer my name is martine charles i had been in banking for almost 18 years and the stress and pressure of the industry began to wear on me i asked god to provide me with a new career that helped me to respond to my financial responsibilities the time to spend with my family a new purpose and also to begin returning a faithful tithe and offering I have to admit, when I started tithing and offering, it actually got harder for me financially. I felt like I couldn't afford it, but I continued. I was determined to see the promises of Malachi 3.10 come to fruition in my life. During this time, my best friend of 20 years lost her husband to suicide, and a week before her husband died, she had lost her job. It was a very difficult time for her. I tried to help her financially, spiritually, in any way that I could. That's why I'm contemplating going back to a corporate job. to corporate America, especially knowing everything that you've gone through with your children, and I know that this is important for you to be there for them at this time. And what can I do then? Why don't you start a transportation brokerage company? I know that you've been helping his, your friend out in his trucking business over the last several months, and you've learned a lot. So I've been thinking about the idea that you gave to me. Mm-hmm. I already have a lot of connections in the industry. Yeah. The potential for profit is really, really great. But I'd like for you to do it with me. Oh, yes, I'll do it with you. Yes, I'll do it with you. 
I am normally pretty conservative about business ventures. To my surprise, I immediately agreed. We started our transportation logistics company delivering goods all over the metro Atlanta area and made the decision to dedicate our business to the Lord. We declared that this was his business and we were his humble servants. On our website, there is a red banner on the top that represents the blood of Jesus and a constant reminder that this business is for him. In August of 2017, we started our first contract and in one week, we made back our initial investment. We've never had to put money back into the business and it's been profitable since its start. God has blessed me beyond all that I could ask or imagine through this business. Not only was I able to leave the stress of banking behind, I had more time to spend with my family. In addition, I was in a better financial position than I had been in previously. I wanna invite you to be faithful to God. He is always faithful to us. What he says he will do, he does. Oh, taste and see.